Now we've heard a little bit about the role of the AI lab in computer music, and next we have John Chowning. So, among the least likely fields that John McCarthy would include within his horizons of interest was music. But in a 16-year association of the music group with the AI lab, the work that was accomplished, nurtured by the multidisciplinary environment that John created, changed the course of music. How did this unlikely association happen? I don't know how sensitive John McCarthy was to music, but some of the people with whom he surrounded himself certainly were. David Poole was one. In 1964, David, an undergraduate, was in one of John's classes. David was also the tuba player in the Stanford Orchestra, a very good one. I was a composer studying with Leland Smith and also in the orchestra, a timpanist. Timpanists and tuba players have lots of rests in symphonic music. So we had many opportunities to talk. But we did not talk about computers. In fact, I did not know anything about David's academic interests except that he was a math major. We talked about music, folk arts, boats, but he never talked about computers. So, standing clueless with a box of punch cards in my hands in the Stanford Computer Center in September 1964, it was a great surprise and my good fortune to have met my friend, David Poole. 30 years old, technically illiterate, I was following a dream based upon Max Matthews' assertion that any sound that can be generated by a computer could be, as long as we assume, the uh, loudspeakers as a source. My dream was to synthesize music that moved freely in an illusory reverberant space using four loudspeakers. I had gotten the sound synthesis program, the box of cards in my hands, from, the Max, from Max at Bell Labs a month earlier. Fascinated by the idea, David quickly figured out that between the IBM 7090, the AI's PDP-1, and a shared disk, it was possible to construct a music synthesis system. Ed Feigenbaum, then director of the Comp Center, gave me some 7090 time, but we needed permission to use the PDP-1. That is when I met John McCarthy. I asked for computer time. Surprise, he asked, to do what? To make music, I replied, and briefly explained my dream. His expression changed from surprise to doubt. Then David, who was hanging back, stepped up and explained to him that we needed occasional use of the PDP-1 as a sample memory buffer and at CRT XY ladders as DAX. Had he said no, there are a lot of things that would never have happened, and I would certainly not be standing here now. But having confidence that David would not make a trivial request, stroking his chin in thought, he said, OK, and walked away. John McCarthy got it. There was no alternative. Computer music was a path that could not possibly be, have been explored without his help. And John's mind, like many great minds, was adventurous. Following the, more, the move to the DC Power Laboratory, I was looking for efficient ways to synthesize sounds that had dynamism, sounds that would localize in my illusory space. Steve Russell suggested couple, coupled oscillators. Thinking about other ways a pair of oscillators could interact, I tried modulating one oscillator's frequency by another, vibrato, and then began push pushing the vibrato rate and depth well into the audio band. Within minutes, I had synthesized enough examples to know their importance. This was in November 1967. FM synthesis was complicated, but orderly, and as David showed me with a double E textbook in hand, it is perfectly explained by the equations. A couple of years later, I played a brass cannon for John that was synthesized by FM synthesis. He asked me to explain what a cannon was, which I did, 
And he then said, oh, like Frere Jaca. Hours later, I had synthesized Frere Jaca at a lively tempo and told John that I could also make this brass band march around an illusory spray ground. He seemed amused and I felt vindicated. In the 1980s, Yamaha, under Stanford license, began producing musical instruments using FM synthesis, resulting in the most successful engine for synthesis in the history of electronic instruments. In 1966, Leland joined me and began work on a program to facilitate the input of music symbols. At some point, Leland realized that the output of the program he had built for specifying sound could be easily adopted with an additional layer of code to control the AI lab's plotter. The plotter images were photo-reduced, producing elegant printed music. His work advanced with the image, imaging technology in the early 80s, a major music publisher shot began using score rather than typesetting for its new additions. Score became, score became and remains the high-end industry standard. Leland sends his, his regards. Andy Moore came to sail from MIT in 1968. A musician, he followed our work. A couple of years later, he switched from systems programmer to the PhD program under John. His research goal was automatic music transcription from signal to score, difficult problem. He was hooked and we were lucky. He guided many of our graduate students in their work. About the same time, Lauren Rush and John Gray entered the graduate programs in music and psychology, respectively, with their work centered at the AI lab. With Andy, the four of us applied for and were granted NSF grants that allowed us to help finally pay our way at the lab. The research from those years was seminal and remains a central part of the field's response. Of the, yeah. In 1974, the four of us formed Karma with Patty Wood as our administrator. John McCarthy was gracious in losing his secretary. Pierre Boulez spent several weeks at sale with the IRCOM team in preparation for its opening in Paris two years later. They launched with a PDP-10 and our software while we took possession of the Samson box. Tuvar became our systems programmer. David Poole and others in the lab, some of you here, taught me much that I needed to know. Rosh Reddy about acoustics, Dan Swinehart about recursive procedures, Gary Goodman in programming vessel functions, and many more. Les shepherded me through the sale politics and made sure that there was a true record of the enormous number of cycles that we accumulated and why. Well, 3 a.m. we had the machine mostly to ourselves. Finally, the most important and enduring legacy of our sale days was one that Chris Chafe and colleagues have continued at a thriving CCRMA. The AI lab's environment, the multiplicity of disciplines, and especially the intellectual generosity of you, the sale researchers, beginning with a simple okay from John in 1964.